Okay, we're going to look at um, some of the traditions, basic concepts, different things um, that our founding fathers used um, in creating the new government that we have. Um, our first colony here in Jamestown was in 1607. So we have a long history of colonial governments, plus obviously, you know, they all came from England, um, had some concept of what the government was like there. So we're going to look at these things that they actually used when creating their own governments here. Um, so the first idea that we have here um, when creating our governments is the idea of ordered government. Um, an ordered government refers to the type of government whose systems, procedures, and protocol are clearly spelled out and followed by all. So the first concept that I want to throw out at you is this idea of due process, where the government has to follow an exact course of law which means you guys know the rules. Everyone knows what the rules are here in the United States. It's not arbitrary. They don't arrest people and make up crimes and then procedures on, on how to file charges and, and the court proceedings. All of this is established and everyone knows what the rules are, or at least they should. So this first idea of due process was really developed by the Magna Carta in 1215. And the Magna Carta is actually a document um, that was signed, or the, well, the king at that particular time was forced to sign, and we'll look at that here in just a moment. But, you know, the king was able to do whatever they wanted to. We could arrest people, we could put them in jail, we didn't have a charge of another crime, there was really no rhyme or reason or process that they had to follow. So, very early on we established this idea that should not be arbitrary, that we as the people should know exactly what the rules are, and if we break those rules, what's going to happen? And then the other concept um, that I want to throw out here, um, rule by law, which we're actually going to look again at here when we talk about limited government, but it's hard to pull these two across, pull um, them apart. Um, rule by law just means that we have established sets of laws and rules, and everyone has to follow them. Um, there have been times in history, and even you know, and currently, I suppose, in some governments, um, that those people who make the laws are not subject to the laws that are created, and that was true of the kings um, and the monarchs for many years. Um, so we have rules that are established. Everyone has to follow them. That's this idea of rule by law. And then we have a due process. We have a process that everyone must follow, and it applies the same to everyone. The second basic tradition or idea that we brought with us um, is an understanding of limited government. Um, and there were three historical documents that were very important to the development of the British Constitution. And the British Constitution is different than ours. Ours is a written out document that we can pull up um, and look at specifically what the rules are. The British Constitution is just a series of court rulings, common law, um, part of it's written down, part of it's not. So um, you can't go and actually find a document that is the British Constitution. But the Magna Carta was also known as the Great Charter, and it was signed in 1215. Um, and it did establish this idea of rule by law. No one is above the law, including the monarch. We have a written set of laws that everyone must follow. And if you listen to the news very often, especially when you have someone in government or in politics who have broken rules or broken laws, um, and are in trouble or go to jail. You know, they will talk about, you know, we are a system of rule of law, um, and that's very important. Um, just throwing out a few other things that we get from the Magna Carta. Um, due process, talked about that. Habeas corpus literally means have the body. Um, and what that means is um, you cannot be arrested and held without them charging you with a crime. If you do, or if they do, you can file what's called a writ of habeas corpus where they have to take you to the courts and the court is going to say you either charge this person with their crime or you have to let them go. Um, the Magna Carta put limits on the king's ability to tax, it protected citizens' um, um, private property, gave some religious freedom and the idea of trial by jury. And all of these today seem, um, you know, these are things that we have and it seems like common sense, but back in the day, you know, it was not, and uh, people did not have those rights. Second document under um, limited government was the Petition of Rights. Now remember, the Magna Carta is 1215, so this is 1628, so we're talking obviously years later. But you know, there's a, still this progression of uh, putting more power in the hands of the people and less power in the hands of the government in England. 
So a couple things we get from the Petition of Rights is you have to have a legal reason for imprisonment. Parliament had to um, approve taxation. The king had a lot of troops. He didn't have any money to um, pay for barracks and places to quarter them, so he just said we're going to house them in people's homes. And when we start looking at the amendments to the Constitution, the, amendment, the Third Amendment says that we don't have to quarter troops in our homes. We don't have to house troops in our homes. So today we're once again going, why is this a big deal? But it was a big deal at one point. Um, and then the English Bill of Rights. Um, a few years later, 1689, we're taking more and more power from the king and putting it into the hands of Parliament, which is what um, the government in England is called. Um, and this document gives the right for people to petition the government to to challenge the government and say we would like to see certain things changed. Um, speedy and fair trials, trial by jury, uh, protection against cruel and unusual punishment, the right to bear arms. Once again, these are things that we are all familiar with today. But at one point in time, you know, these were not the norm. I want to look just a little bit um, at the difference between the English Bill of Rights that we just talked about, and then the United States Bill of Rights. There's some pretty significant differences um, uh, in the fundamentals of these documents. The English Bill of Rights was ratified, and ratified means formally approved by Parliament, and Parliament themselves could change it. When we look at our, the United States Bill of Rights, it was ratified by the people. You had the government who wrote it, but then it was sent to the states, and the states um, legislatures had to vote on that document. So we, we have the national government um, who wrote it, but it was sent to the states for the people to formally approve it. Approve it. And it can only be uh, changed through the amending process, which is set up in the Constitution, and it takes both the national government, but once again, any changes have to be sent to the states for the people to be a part of that process. And then the English Bill of Rights was primarily intended to limit the powers of the king, but to increase the powers of Parliament, which is the government. Ours is different in the fact that it limits the powers of this government from violating our individual rights. And its goal is to protect the people and protect minorities. So instead of increasing the power of the government, which the English Bill of Rights did, taking it out of the hands of the monarch, putting it into the hands of Parliament, this, our Bill of Rights, protects us from the federal government and says these are the things that the federal government cannot do. And then the third main idea um, is the idea of representative government. So we have ordered government, um, we have limited government, and then number three is representative government. Um, in England, we have par they have Parliament, and they still do, and they have what's called the House of Lords and the House of Commons. So they have two different houses. Um, the House of Lords, that is an inherited position, um, or you are appointed to that. Um, that's your nobility. The House of Commons, these people who sit in the House of Commons, they are elected to that particular office. And so I've got two terms down there, bicameral and unicameral legislature. A legislature is a lawmaking body. And we are familiar with, or we're familiar with, this idea of a bicameral legislature. England had a bicameral. They had two houses, House of Lords, House of Commons. Um, so when we create our Constitution, we create a bicameral legislature. We call our legislature Congress, and we have the House of Representatives, and we have the Senate. Now, we do have a few states that have what's called a unicameral legislature, which means there's only one house. Um, but for the most part, almost all the 50 states have a bicameral legislature, and our national government has a bicameral legislature. And then Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution guarantees a Republican form of government. Um, part of the reason that we fought the Revolutionary War is because we had to pay taxes that had no representation in Parliament. Um, so it's not that the colonies were... Um, objecting to paying their fair share of taxes. It's just they thought it wasn't fair. They have no say-so in the laws that are being applied to them. The king and parliament denied um, any representatives from the colonies to be sent to England. Um, and so the colonists had a real problem with that. And so we want to make sure that every state has representation. So when we talk about um, a republican form of government, that's what it's interpreted to mean, that every state will have representation um, in the government.